really uh, the title of the message is um, Jesus is Transfigured, but we really could make it part three of um, the identity of the Messiah because it, it all ties together. All three gospel writers that record it, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all tie it together with a joint verse in terms of the events that take place at Caesarea Philippi and, uh, and what takes, here, takes place here in what is probably Mount Hermon, uh, which is the largest mountain in Israel. But uh, Jesus takes them from Caesarea Philippi up to a high mountain, uh, Peter, James, and John, and then uh, the term that Matthew uses is transfigured before them. And, uh, and again, so important, he's really preparing them for what lies ahead of him uh, from this cross, from the point that he, he, uh, he's as far away from Jerusalem and the cross geographically as, he, as he's going to get at this point. And when he comes off this mountain, pretty much everything is moving to, to that point, and he's trying to, to prepare them. I was uh, uh, think, thinking about this, and, uh, but just the idea, if you're going through something really, really terrible or really, really hard, if there's somebody there saying, hang in there, it's going to be worth it, you know, and uh, let me give you a little glimpse, you know, it can, uh, it can really, really help. I... Uh, you know, Josh uh, spent the last two summers going out uh, into uh, doing basic training with new cadets coming in. And the reason he wanted to, to do that specifically is because when he was the new guy and he was coming in and life was very hard and life was very difficult and you wondered why you were there and how you got there and things are very disoriented at, uh, at times because of um, you don't even know really when it is you go to bed or when you get up and there's somebody in your face screaming at you all the time for several weeks in a row. And, but at a point in time when you, when you move to a second phase of that, the leadership and the cadre changes. And he had a guy that was, uh, he, he thought was just so great. And, uh, and one of the things that uh, he did for him, well, to start with, he gave up his leave. He could have gone home for three weeks, but instead he came in a sense to uh, instruct those guys. And he said that uh, even though we're running these assault courses and crawling on our bellies through the mud, you know, every day and all these things, he would come into our tent at night and tell us it'll be worth it. He says, and to hang in there. He says, because I want to tell you what my life is like. He says, I drive a brand new Ford F-150 pickup truck. I got these kind of tires and these kind of rims and this kind of a sound system. I make $700 a month. I've traveled all over the world. I've, uh, flown in the back of an F-16, and I get to jump out of airplanes. And I'm telling you, from where I am, it's all worth it. I am days, I am 242 days or whatever it was to throw my hat in the middle of Falcon Stadium, and I'm going to get commissioned, and I'm going to have it, and you can have it too, but you got to hang in there. And you gotta, you got to not just hang in there, but you need to excel right now, do your very, so this, and, and Josh said, I mean, when he was a, a basic, uh, this is all competition by squadrons, and and, uh, and they won everything. They won everything. They won, won the first half of basic training. They won the second half of basic training. He was in the best squadron. He was in the best uh, flight. He was in the best element of uh, uh, basically 12 or 1,300 kids. He was in the best 12 or 13 of them. And he says, but it wasn't us. It was those guys leading us. And I could see the other squadrons, and I could see what was going on. So he says, I wanted to go back out and try to give that to somebody else. But what made a difference is somebody stepping in in the middle of, of a really, what could be a really horrific experience, and it is. They don't have a couple hundred of the cream of the crop in the nation drop out of this for nothing. But what it made a difference is somebody said, this is how it will be in the future, and it'll be worth it. And that's what Jesus is trying to do with these guys right now. Again, he's taken them up to Caesarea Philippi in a way 
from everybody else in the crowds and said, who do people say that I am? But who do you say that I am? You're the Christ, the son of the living God. That's right. And upon that confession, I'm going to build my church. I know you're not familiar with that term and it's going to need some explanation, but it has everything to do with the, the kingdom of God. But here's the plan of salvation. You know, I have to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And then I'll rise again. And of course, Peter jumps in, never, because our fate's tied to you. Plus, we love you. Don't want to see that happen. And they have to go through this whole discussion. They get that all straightened out. And then Jesus uh, says uh, to them, if you are in this with me, then you must deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But if you're willing to lose your life for me and for the gospel, then you'll save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? And those are pretty hard words. And we went through those uh, last week and enumerated them that it's going to be difficult for them. Jesus knew exactly what would happen to them. He knew exactly what was going to happen to himself, what they would witness, what they would see in the whole experience. And he's trying to prepare them for it. And now he takes at the end of that in verse 28, and it's all tied together. Uh, he says that some of you here will not see death until you see a glimpse of what I'm talking about in terms of the kingdom of God. And then he takes Peter, James, and John up to, up to the mountain and he's transfigured for them. So it's, it's for a reason, it's for a purpose, it's to try to prepare them and help them see this is why it's all going to be worth it uh, in the end. Now, I want to uh, uh, point out that connecting phrase. In, in Matthew's gospel, Mark's gospel, it says, after six days, then he said this. Luke's gospel says about eight days. So there's no contradiction there. Luke just counts uh, the, the day of Peter's confession when all that comes down and the, and the day uh, at the end when, uh, when Jesus is transfigured before them. So, the other guys, and he says about, the other guys count the six uh, in between. Always uh, important to point out the, quote, apparent contradictions and show that they're not. But also, again, it's a key phrase that links all of this together. Let's take a look at the text, and I'm going to read uh, the entire episode to you, starting in verse 1. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The disciples asked him, Why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Let's go back and first look at the idea that Jesus is transfigured before eyewitnesses. And of course, they're mentioned Peter, James, and John. And this is not the only time that he separates or pulls aside these three. Other times when he's praying for someone, uh, giving other instructions. But again, Jesus was always trying to minister to the multitudes that they might become disciples, the disciples that they might become apostles, people that he can entrust with more responsibility in teaching and, and to send them out. And even among the disciples, he still had the three. And even among the three, he still had uh, Peter. But again, always trying to draw people in a sense closer to himself that he could build them up and send them out. So very special experience for these three. Uh, Peter would later write about it, and we'll read about that in a moment in Second Peter. Uh, John takes this experience and uses it to open up his, his gospel as well. Luke uses the term, uh, the idea of this promise uh, to them of see the kingdom of God. 
And what Jesus is doing for a moment anyway is removing or pulling back or drawing back the, the veil of his own flesh that they might see uh, his glory. Again, John, when he opens his gospel, uh, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word uh, was God. Uh, and, uh, excuse me. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And then in verse 14, uh, he goes on and says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have beheld his glory. And that's what he's talking about here. The glory of the one and only um, come from the Father, full of grace and, and truth. They were able to see his glory for, for just a, a moment. And uh, as I said, preparing them for what lies uh, ahead. Letting them know it will be worth it. Uh, second, uh, thirdly, the eyewitnesses saw Jesus' appearance radically change. It says his face shone like the sun. His clothes were white as light. The word uh, uh, that is used here is, is uh, transfigured or metamorphosis. So what's going on here is is uh, Jesus is allowing them to see him as he really is, uh, as he really is. This is uh, the Jesus that would have existed from all eternity. Uh, this is the Jesus that uh, certainly is uh, after the resurrection. If you read Revelation, uh, the opening chapter, this is the Jesus that you see there. And it's very important to understand this is the Jesus that will come again, not their suffering servant uh, of uh, Isaiah 53, not the hippie looking guy with some leather sandals. The guy that is returning is, is God incarnate who is going to set up his kingdom here on earth. Uh, and, uh, and it will be just the way it is here. What they saw, we will see. But there's the other part of that here is we'll see in a moment in terms of it being worth it. They're seeing something they couldn't comprehend that he, he opens uh, the door in a sense to eternity and lets them look in. Because we know from Scripture is that, and we will be like him. Whatever you're going to go through, the difficult days ahead, you can imagine in their own minds, they're kind of rolling along with Jesus in this. They're pretty convinced that, that he is the Messiah. He's calming the waters. He's feeding the multitudes. He's healing uh, every sick person, every diseased person, every demon-possessed person. Uh, they're pretty much convinced of that. They have to make this confession. He kind of pins them down. Who do you uh, say that I am? But it's important that they, they get the bigger picture of who he is, that he's God come in the flesh, and to be able to see him the way he has existed for uh, all eternity, so that when they prayed in his name, it would mean a lot more. Uh, when we pray in the name of Jesus, it's not the hippie guy with the sandals. It's God Almighty. And... Um, who holds all things under, under his control. I, I would encourage you to look, read through that passage in Revelation 1 uh, later on. Uh, again, they see a, a face that shines like the sun, his clothes that were white uh, as light. The idea of metamorphosis means uh, an internal change. Uh, it's used two other times in the Bible. Uh, one time in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory and are being transformed, metamorphosis, into his glory. An internal change that ends up being expressed outwardly. Now that's talking about, again, Paul there, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's used by Paul later in, uh, in Philippians as, uh, as well. When he says our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Same word, metamorphosis. And that is talking about what they saw in him. He's saying they will be one day uh, and it will be worth it uh, as, a, as a result. We know by way of illustration, and we use it in terms of uh, 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 how a caterpillar forms a cocoon and turns into a butterfly. If you look at the caterpillar, if you look at the cocoon uh, and say, what is that? Most people don't say, well, that's a butterfly. But if you took its DNA, the DNA would say, that's a butterfly. Uh, it's already a butterfly. It just hasn't had gone through a metamorphosis yet so that you can see what it really is. And that's again, is the, is the same word. Uh, the DNA of Jesus was God Almighty, <laughs> the all-existent one. And, uh, and what they were allowed to see for a moment was a transfiguration, a metamorphosis, so they could under, understand that. 
again, Paul gives some uh, very specific uh, information to us about resurrection. That's what we're really talking about in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, if you want to turn there. That is kind of the classic uh, teaching or passage with lots of information uh, on resurrection. Sometimes folks uh, ask you, well, well, what will it be like in heaven? Or what is a resurrected body like? And so forth. Well, again, it will be like Jesus's. We, we know that. Uh, we shall, uh, when we see him, you know, we're, we're going to be, uh, be the same. And uh, Paul says here, if you want to, again, turn there, because I'm going to read uh, several verses, really a whole, uh, whole paragraph or so. 1 Corinthians 15, 35, or 30, 36 says, How foolish... Um, uh, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And so, again, something must die if it's going to come to life, Paul says, and he's going to illustrate that with a plant. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, be uh, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined to each kind of seed he gives its own body. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh. Animals have another, birds another, and fish another. But there's also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind. The splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another. And stars differ from star in splendor. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown perishable is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So again, there's different kinds of bodies. Uh, he compares it uh, again to a seed in the ground. It's just a seed, but what comes forth is entirely different. That's the way it will be for us. Then he compares uh, that we can see different bodies that we uh, uh, in the universe as we look around. And then he goes through a series of contrasting statements, but our resurrection body will be different. One is sown this way, ours will be different. And then he goes on and concludes in verse 50, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Again, the kingdom of God, which is the subject, has everything to do with heaven and resurrection. That's, that's the idea. Nor does a perishable inherit imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. That's the point uh, of uh, Paul here, that we will be uh, come from, again, what is perishable, what is decaying, what is wasting away, I know mine's wasting away more and more all the time, as I, especially when I get up in the morning and I feel it more. But one day, again, God does that to remind us of eternity, that we're going to long for and have a resurrected body one day. Uh, and it will be completely different, and it will be like His. Jesus is spending a lot of time teaching them about the kingdom of God, about the king, coming of the kingdom of God. Uh, and this is of critical importance, and you can see by Peter's reaction that Again, uh, which is understandable, they are very much locked into the kingdom of the Messiah. He is the Messiah, his kingdom must be coming, and they know that through the prophets in the Old Testament, he will establish his kingdom on earth, but their concept of the kingdom of God is, is very limited. You know, they're just thinking of a king that comes and he sets them free from the Romans and they have peace on earth. And uh, yeah, but, <clears throat> but what God is trying to show them, it's so much more than that. It's so much bigger uh, than that. So the transfiguration takes place before eyewitnesses, and it's for a specific purpose. They can understand that whatever they're going to go through in the future, it's going to be worth it. Secondly, Jesus is transfigured, and there is exceptional appearances of Old Testament saints. And, and we see from our text that he speaks with Moses and Elijah. Now, we know from Luke's gospel, uh, a little more information. In Luke 9.30, it says, Moses and Elijah appeared in glorious splendor. Talking with Jesus, they spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. So, quite a Bible conference. Wish we had the CDs for this one. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus talking about his coming departure. Exodus is uh, the word that could be translated there. These two fellows knew something uh, uh, about that term as, as well. The Greek text indicates that it was an extended conversation. And you know, we just get a little glimpse as Peter and the boys... <laughs> 
uh, did I mention that they were sleeping uh, again? Uh, but as they kind of come to and catch all that's going on here, uh, this apparently, uh, this conversation had been taking place for, for some time. Why these two in particular? Well, I, one thing we know for sure, it's because Moses really represented the law. Even in scripture, we often say the law of Moses. Uh, so here he is, the lawgiver himself, Moses. Elijah representing really the, the prophets because, again, Elijah is the prophet that takes on the, all of the false teachers of, of his day. You remember there on Mount Carmel and he basically under the, the reign of uh, Ahab in the north and just a, a very evil time in, in Israel, uh, Elijah takes on, you know, all the prophets of Baal and, you know, he builds his altar. We'll build our altar, you know. You call fire down from heaven. I'll call fire down from heaven. We'll see whose God is the real God. And then, of course, Elijah would say, now, who are you going to serve? And uh, you know the story. Uh, of course, the prophets of Baal march around it as, as would any, any leaders of any false religion today, wh whatever you, you want to name them, as they would march around and they would not hear from heaven as those did uh, in that day. And they could uh, cut themselves and they could chant and they could go on and on, but nothing, uh, nothing happened as would nothing happen today. Uh, and then Elijah, of course, builds the trench, fills it full of water. He calls fire down from heaven. It consumes the, uh, the, not just the sacrifice, the altar and all the water and, and so on and so forth. And then has to challenge them and who will you serve? Elijah, the great prophet, representing the, uh, the prophets. Now, again, interesting, in Luke 24, uh, Jesus even uses the term when he refers to us what we call the Old Testament, always the law and the prophets. And, of course, to a, in a Jewish Bible, the prophets, we think of the prophecies, but the prophets considered uh, all, contained all of the historical books as well. First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, everything except what we call the poetical books. And... Um, uh, Paul makes reference to this and compares them to Jesus Christ in Romans 3.21. He says, uh, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law, that's what we have in Jesus, a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which uh, the law and the prophets testify. They spoke about it and now their representatives are on that mountain, Moses and Elijah speaking to him about it as well. How would that righteousness come about? Through his exodus, through his departure, through his death, uh, and through his resurrection. Uh, now, it's interesting also, my personal opinion that is that they represent two groups of people as well. Because if you think about it, Elijah never died. Elijah was raptured. There's several raptures uh, in the Bible. We're, we're awaiting one our, our, ourselves. But uh, Elijah was raptured, taken up to heaven in the chariots of fire. So in terms of what is our subject, resurrection, glorified bodies, the coming kingdom of God, and to some people that will happen in a rapture, again represented by Elijah. Uh, secondly, you've got Moses who we know died and was buried, and so in terms of resurrection and how that comes about, that will also take place to those that have died you know, again prior to the coming of the Lord. But uh, also both of them led an exodus. Moses led the people on a departure or exodus out of Egypt from bondage and slavery. And as I mentioned, Elijah led the people out of a bondage uh, away from uh, idolatry. So uh, Jesus, again, the subject matter of how he will lead us in a greater exodus uh, out of the power and the penalty of sin that we might have a, a resurrected body. So eyewitnesses to this incredible encounter uh, so much that it impacts their lives and, and they would write about it later. Uh, there's an exceptional appearance of these two very interesting characters here uh, of the Old Testament and what they uh, really represent to us. Uh, in 3, in verses 48, we see that uh, Jesus is transfigured and receives exalted honor uh, and glory. And uh, he certainly is exalted by uh, the Shekinah of glory of God that uh, envelops them. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, but uh, uh, because it has everything to do with being the presence of the Father. And we're going to look at his words as well. But secondly, Jesus is exalted by Peter wanting to celebrate the glory of the moment. And we often read, again, we appreciate Peter. He makes us feel better because he says dumb stuff too. Uh, but 
Again, try to understand what, what he's saying. He's been there at Caesarea Philippi. He's made the confession that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the son of the living God. If he's the Messiah, he is bringing his messianic kingdom. Our life is going to be better. It's going to be different. This is all going to, we're on board with this. And then he tells them, oh yeah, did I mention the fact that I'm going to suffer and die? What? You know, it's like, I don't think I remember reading that. Of course, it was there. It was Isaiah 53, Psalm 22. We know that it's all there, but they were so focused, and you could understand, living under the Roman rule at that time, that the kingdom they wanted, they wanted it now. They didn't want a postponement in the kingdom, which is really what's happened because of the national rejection of Jesus and the leaders committing the unpardonable sin. But here, Peter, uh, they, they all want all this now. And they know, they know. What do they do every year at Passover? They're uh, at, at a point in time in, in the Passover Seder, they send the kids outside. And who are they looking for? Elijah. They've got an empty chair for Elijah. They're hoping Elijah will come every year, year after year. Peter's done that since, since he was a little kid. Why? Because when Elijah comes, Messiah, the kingdom. So here he is. I mean, it's like Jesus is the Messiah. We got that. We got this suffering death thing. We're not real thrilled about that. But now on this mountain, who shows up? Elijah. All right, we're back on track, baby. This thing is going to happen. So he says, let's celebrate. And again, it's the fall. The feast that's coming up is Sukkoth or the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths where they would uh, leave the home for a week, go set up their little tent outside, put little palm branches over it and live outside for a week and, and celebrate and remember God's faithfulness because their forefathers lived in a tent, went through the wilderness wandering and God provided for them and took care of them. And he took them into the promised land. The promised land. It's that time of year. The coming kingdom. The ultimate promise. Let's build three booths. Let's celebrate Sukkot right here. I mean, see, this seems kind of crazy. And of course, even one of the other gospel writers <laughs> say, Peter said this because he didn't know what he was saying. <laughs> didn't stop him though. You know, he'd probably be a uh, a good news reporter today. Uh, <laughs> truth never stands in the way of a good story. But, um, but nonetheless, here he is. You, know, you can understand his excitement a little bit and why he would say what he said. And you can understand then when they come off the mountain, why there is a continual discussion about Elijah and what's the deal. Because the kingdom is not going to come unless he comes. Wasn't he just here? Is he coming again? You can understand the confusion that would, I mean, it was an incredible experience, but you can understand why they were confused a bit as well. But as far as Peter could in his own mind, he was exalting Jesus. You are the Messiah. I knew it all along. Let's, let's build three booths right here. But thirdly, and uh, more importantly, is Jesus is exalted by the Father's uh, presence, which uh, we mentioned is a Shekinah glory of God and his cloud and his words. It wasn't just a cloudy day up there. Uh, it was, it was the presence of God, the father. Look at verse five again, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified, and, uh, and again, some of the different translations, the NIV is probably the best using the term terrified. They were, they were terrified at what was, was, uh, was going on. Uh, God's presence had uh, enveloped them. And of course, you've got Moses and Elijah, and there's the reaction to that. But, but a, certainly a greater reaction because of, uh, of God's uh, voice uh, in terms of God the Father and, and what was going on here. Now, they had not seen the Shekinah glory of God. Remember, the Shekinah glory is what leads the people out uh, of uh, Egypt. You know, a pillar of fire by night, a cloud by day. Uh, and then when they build their tabernacle, God's presence dwells over it. Nobody had to wonder, is God, <coughs> God with us today? Mm, look right over in that direction. <sighs> You know, God's presence was with them. And when it moved, of course, they packed up and moved and literally followed his, uh, his presence. Later, when Solomon builds the temple, God's Shekinah glory fills that temple once again. But of course, as the people went further and further into idolatry, Ezekiel tells us of the day when God's presence lifted right out of the temple and moved up over the Mount of Olives and went away. And they didn't see it since. 
and nobody had seen it since until Jesus was born. Luke 2, 8 says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. That's the Shekinah glory. And they were, same reaction, they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. So what's going on here? Is, uh, is Jesus is allowing them to have this experience and see him, in a sense, in his eternity or in his glory to prepare them. But what's going on with the Father is the Father's really bringing a couple of things to Jesus that perhaps he needed to hear and perhaps they needed to hear as well. One is that the Father confirms the identity and the authority of, of the Son. Uh, they knew that they knew, but now they really know. Uh, the Father confirms the identity of Jesus. Uh, uh, again, as the, as the Son of God, and also the authority of Jesus as he says, listen to him. Here's the law and the prophets. That's great, but listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Do what, uh, what he says. Do what he tells you to do. Now, I think there's four reasons why it's, it was important for them and, and for us as well. Uh, one, uh, this scene confirmed to the apostles the confession of, of Peter. Jesus was certainly the, the uh, Messiah, the anointed one, and that's why he would uh, write about this experience later. Again, if you want to turn to 2 Peter 1.15, uh, I'm going to read verses 15 to, uh, to 21. And uh, this is where Peter talks about this, and then he makes a contrast and a comparison that's very important to us as well. 2 Peter 1.15, And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. Peter feels like this is maybe the last thing, and it was, that he was ever going to write down for believers to read later. And there's two things he figures is probably the most important things he's ever put down. And the first one, he says in verse 16, is, We did not follow cleverly invented stories. When we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We didn't make all this up. We're not all be willing to be martyred and, and die for our faith, for some fable or some story. No, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And that majesty is this experience we're studying about, as he tells us in verse 17. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory. As far as Peter was concerned, the reason that that was going on is that God the Father was giving Jesus honor and glory. And, uh, and again, perhaps Jesus needed that as well as he's getting ready to go to what would be a, a brutal death uh, on behalf of us. What does he say about the voice? It came from the majestic glory. <laughs> well, in the present time, all they knew is we're on our face and we could be dead any moment. And they're, they're terrified. But uh, in terms of the experience, when he remembers it, majestic glory, saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. So there's Peter's, again, reflection on this experience. Here's the contrast, very importantly, verse 19. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Paul, uh, Peter says this was... A very incredible spiritual experience. We were, we were radically terrified at the time. Looking back, man, it was that, that Shekinah glory around us was majestic glory. And man, did it really confirm to us in terms of who Jesus was, his identity, and, and what we were looking at for the future in terms of the kingdom of God. It was an incredible experience. But he says, and you guys have got something better though, because you've got scripture. You, you've got this. Don't ever let somebody's spiritual experience override this because you have the word of the prophets made more certain. 
Because we could all say, well, well, I wish I could have an experience like that. You know, then I'd, re- I'd go anywhere for Jesus. I'd do anything for him. If I could see him, his face shining and all that, boy, I would. Not according to Peter. He had it. And he says, that actually, what we have in the scriptures uh, is actually more, uh, more important. And he talks here about, about how they were inspired to write. He says, we weren't, we weren't writing the Bible uh, because it was our will or somehow God inspired us to write. He literally inspired the words that we wrote down. And there is a distinction between those two things. So uh, very, very importantly here in terms of uh, what's going on and the reason this event takes place. Secondly, it was an opportunity for the father to encourage the son before he headed towards Jerusalem, as we've already kind of alluded to this. And, and again, it's not the first time. The first time that we see this kind of experience in Matthew 3 is at the baptism of Jesus. Uh, there it says, And a voice came from heaven, This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. From the birth of Jesus to the beginning of his ministry, he did everything perfectly and was always perfectly in the center of God's will according to God the Father, this voice from heaven. What was the childhood of Jesus like? I wish they would have given us more details. I can tell you what it was like. He was perfect and he was always perfectly in the center of God's will. That's all we really need to know. Yeah, but did he play hopscotch? People ask some pretty ridiculous questions. It's not really important. The important thing is when he's ready to begin his ministry, he fully receives the approval of God the Father. Now from the beginning of his ministry to now he's ready to move towards Jerusalem once again, completing his ministry in a sense. Not that he's not through debating with the Pharisees and and some other teaching, but as he leaves this point, he's really headed towards the cross and headed towards Jerusalem. And God the Father says, right on. Everything you've done, everything you've said, every moment of your life has been perfect. With you, I am well pleased. So that's the importance of this. It was important perhaps for Jesus to hear it, but it was certainly important for the disciples to hear it as well. Thirdly, the reason this scene is important is it's an illustration of what Jesus had been teaching them about the kingdom of God. Again, to try to help clarify the kingdom of God will be a messianic kingdom. Jesus will reign. He will set up his throne uh, from Jerusalem. Peace will come to this earth. It will be a glorious thing. All, everything that is said uh, in the prophets will take place. It is yet future, but it's so much more than uh, people just not fighting with each other in the Middle East, you know, and having a good economy. That, it's, it's so much more than that. How much more? Jesus goes, look at this, you know, and they're like, you know, they're on, they're on their face. Uh, it's about a resurrected body. It's about living for all eternity. And, uh, and, and it's an illustration of what he's been talking about. So now when he says the kingdom of God is like, they're going, wow, okay. This, is, this takes on a, you know, a, a bigger, a fuller picture. And, and, and it should for us as well. When we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about all eternity and what eternity would be like. I mentioned last week the idea of how important it it was for them, and I think this is part of it, of of having this idea of an eternal perspective. And uh, I just thought about... uh, well, how do you get that or how do, you, how do you keep that? And I know just as a practical thing in my own life, one of the ways I get it is by reading stories and books by people who've got it. <laughs> if I, I read about Hudson Taylor. I read about the great missionaries, John Wesley, these guys. Uh, you know, read the books by K.P. Johan, and man, that guy's got an eternal perspective. And it's like, okay, I see it. I understand it. it, it it's so important that we, we grasp it. That's part of what's going on, an illustration of what he had been teaching them. And then fourthly, so that they could see a transformed life. So they would be encouraged uh, to follow him. We do not follow Jesus Christ for self-fulfillment. We follow him because he's taking us to heaven. You know, again, it's, it's not about this life. Certainly it is in terms of how God might use our life, how many people we could take with us. Uh, he's given us all gifts and talents and, and so forth. And, uh, and it's a thrill to be used by Jesus. But the reason he died on a cross is not so we could be self-fulfilled and have meaning and purpose in life. Although we have that in Christ as a, as a believer. But it's so we could go to heaven. It's so that we could have a, a resurrected body. So eyewitnesses, an exceptional appearance of a couple of Old Testament figures, exalted honor and glory, 
And then fourthly, Jesus is transfigured and he instructs the disciples concerning the experience uh, itself. And we note that the disciples are not to speak of the experience until after the resurrection. Jesus would use the term many times, my time had not yet come. And, um, and again, they knew that, uh, uh, back to this issue, they knew that when Elijah came, then the kingdom would be coming. So it was very confusing. Uh, okay, the kingdom is coming, uh, but you're going to suffer first. I don't get that, but I get it when Elijah shows up. That means we're, uh, we're, we're back in the running. We're bringing this thing. It's, you know, maybe next week, maybe next month, maybe next year, you know, the Messianic kingdom is coming. And Peter's thinking, and probably the others as well. Uh, but then uh, Jesus has to, uh, to let them know, no, don't build three booths here. Uh, we're not going to celebrate the Feast of Sukkoth now. Uh, it's, it's much more than that. that um, uh, but it was an ongoing issue with these guys. I don't want you to speak about this. I wanted you to see it. I wanted you to experience it. I wanted you to know it. Now don't talk about it until after my resurrection. Did they then? Yeah. Remember when Jesus is about ready to ascend to heaven in Acts 1? Oh, by the way, that thing about the kingdom, when is it coming? That was, that was the last question. Jesus is going up to, to, to heaven. And that was what they asked him about. It was still an ongoing, you know, thing. This idea of the postponement of the kingdom was a very hard thing for them to grasp. And, uh, and Jesus, remember, he says, you know, the times are not really for you to know. Here's what you need to know. But my Holy Spirit will come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both here in Jerusalem, Judea, and the uttermost parts of the world. Okay, <laughs> it's not exactly what they wanted to hear. It's what they needed uh, because their lives were to be about, again, taking his words and his message and bringing that message of the kingdom to the lives of other people. That's what he was trying to prepare them for. And they certainly desperately needed the Holy Spirit to do that. But this issue, that's why he says to them, now don't talk about this. I need you to experience it, but don't talk about it uh, anymore until after my resurrection. And then that begged the question, the second thing disciples needed to understand, this experience as it pertains to Elijah, because they needed to know that, uh, or, or they, they knew that when Elijah came, then the kingdom would come. So is he not coming? Is he coming? Was that it? Will it be future? You kind of said that stuff about John the Baptist alluding to him, you know, coming in the power of Eli Elijah. Was that it? You can understand why they had a few questions about everything is set on this. You know, again, from the time they're two years old, every Passover, it's the Elijah thing. There's a seed. Is he outside? Is he coming? Because he's got to come before the Messiah comes. We're talking about the kingdom. How does this all relate? Again, the last verses of our Old Testament speak of this, Malachi 4, 5. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I would come and strike the land with a curse. So Elijah will come. And Jesus is saying, don't panic here. The kingdom is coming. It is going to play out exactly that, that way. Uh, and, uh, and he will come. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children. And children to their fathers. Why would that have to happen in a Jewish home? Because if a child put their faith in Jesus of Nazareth uh, as the Messiah, there's going, to be, uh, there's going to be some hard times there. You know, if the dad decides Jesus is the Messiah, his kids aren't going to be real thrilled about it. You know, so Elijah's got to come and, and kind of mend fences here. You know, and it's, I know David Hawking had talking to one rabbi, which um, he has a lot of fun talking and, and debating uh, with them. And, and he said, well, if Elijah shows up and says Jesus is the Messiah, will you believe then? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I'll, I, I got to wait for that day. So that's the purpose of Elijah coming. You know, again, into the tribulation, during that time period, uh, there's a lot going on in Israel in terms of uh, Jewish people receiving Jesus as a Messiah. It's causing major schisms and families and everything. Elijah shows up and he mends all that. Certainly that was part of the message of John the Baptist as, as well. Uh, he, these same lines were quoted of his life and the ministry that he had uh, in Israel. So they're very confused over this. And he says, Elijah is going to come. The kingdom is going to come. It's just po postponed for the time being. But if you understand it, he's already come and he's already suffered and they're going to do the same thing to me. And then they knew that he was talking about John the Baptist. 
So again, it's not a, maybe a big issue with us. It was a very big issue with them. If we're going to go and suffer and die, we need to know what's going to happen. We need to know that Elijah is going to come. We need to know that the scriptures are true. We need to know that everything we read and everything we expected is going to happen just the way we thought it would happen because it's God's word and we need to know that God's word is true if we're going to really burn the boats and follow you to Jerusalem at this point. And Jesus says, it is. You can trust the Bible. You can trust God's word. And by the way, did you hear the voice of my father? You can trust me. And you can trust my words as well. Very important for these guys to hear this because of what awaited them. What I want us to take away is that it's very important for us to understand this as well. Everything rides on the identity of of the Messiah, who he is, so that he was qualified to die for our sins. If he's just a man, he could die for the life of one man. Only God could come in the flesh and die and pay the penalty for all mankind. If we understand his identity, then we can understand the plan of redemption and we can understand the anticipation of what may happen in this life. May mean not great things, maybe suffering, maybe difficult as most Christians experience, but, but it's all going to be worth it in the end. And uh, that's what we need to live for and that's what we need to understand. It's all about having an eternal perspective, but it's all wrapped up into the identity of Jesus Christ. They heard the voice of the Father. They saw Elijah and Moses. Jesus is transfigured, and they understand the truth concerning Elijah and John the Baptist. They're ready to follow. One of the guys said to me after the uh, service last last week, he had said that, um, he says, oh, by the way, I, I lost my job on Friday. Oh, wow. Bad timing. It's always bad timing, right? But this is really bad timing. And he said, that's okay. I burned the boats a long time ago. That's what we're talking about. I mean, when the the difficulties of life come, what's the real reality here? Are we committed or not? Are we committed if Jesus is good to us all the time and life is good and abundant and flowing? Or if it's, well, this life don't really matter that much anyway other than what I can do for the Lord. If that's the attitude, then, you know, a lot of these other things in life, we're able to take a lot more in stride and kind of keep going. That's what those guys needed to hear at this point. And, and certainly that's a good thing for us to hear as well. You are forever, Lord of ages, God before time. We are a vapor, you are eternal. Love everlasting, reigning on high. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Highest praises, honor and glory.